Even the smoothest movie production is a creative tug of war between the director and the studios, typically resulting in a series of compromises in order to keep both sides at least somewhat happy. But these 10 directors, from venerated icons and Oscar winners to more niche up-and-comers, pulled off absolutely and absurdly smart games of 4D chess with the bigwigs at the studio who attempted to mess with their vision. So let's take a look at them today, as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 ingenious way film directors beat the studio. Number 10. John Ford only shot the material he needed to avoid studio meddling, which is most of his movies. It's no secret that even the most organized filmmaker shoots far more footage than actually ends up in the final movie, and that's becoming ever more true in the age of digital filmmaking, which has no need to consider the expense of shooting on film stock. Mad Max Fury Road, for instance, had a shooting ratio of 240 to 1, capturing roughly 480 hours of footage for the two-hour final movie. But even back in the golden age of Hollywood, it was extremely common for films to be shot at a ratio as high as 10 to 1. Yet, a a select circle of filmmakers realized that they could minimize the shooting ratio in order to help them maintain creative control. Alfred Hitchcock famously shot at a 3 to 1 ratio most of the time, and the legendary John Ford was reportedly even stricter. Ford would shoot minimal takes and only the bare minimum coverage to protect himself in the editing room, but otherwise shot little extraneous material so that the studio couldn't interfere with the final product. This is allegedly why Ford worked with so many cast members time and time again, because their professional familiarity allowed him to get what he wanted in just a few takes. When you think about it, that's utterly genius. Number 9. Michael Cimino lied about the length of the wedding scene, the deer hunter. If all else fails, just flat out lie to the studio and hope for the best. This was the bold strategy employed by the late, great Michael Cimino while shooting his Oscar-winning opus, The Deer Hunter. The film is famous, or some might say infamous, for its lengthy wedding sequence before the central characters head off to war, totaling a stonking 51 minutes in length. Hilariously, though, Cimino initially claimed to the producers that the scene would only take up a mere 21 minutes of screen time, so one can imagine their surprise when it was a whole half hour longer than expected. Producer Michael Dealey later stated of Chimino's sneaky trick, the plan was to be advanced by stealth rather than straight dealing, and he definitely wasn't wrong. Chimino even went as far as to fire editor Peter Zinner from the movie when he found him cutting the wedding scene down. And though Chimino insisted that he more or less cut the movie himself, Zinner still won a Best Film Editing Oscar for his work. Ultimately, the outcome was a happy one for all involved, as The Deer Hunter won four of its nine Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Director, Supporting Actor, and Film Editing, and performed extremely well at the box office. Unfortunately, this did lead to, um, Heaven's Gate, and the less said about that, the better. Number 8. David Fincher changed the movie's most offensive line to something even more offensive. Fight Club. David Fincher may well be one of the most respected filmmakers working today, but he is himself no stranger to feuding with studios, suffering through the traumatic production of Alien 3 amid constantly meddling from Fox. Production on Fight Club was no picnic either, especially as the studio executives had little faith in the movie, effectively wanting to plane the edges of the film and turn it into something more outwardly commercial. The studio particularly balked at the brief post-coital exchange between Marla and Tyler, where she was originally supposed to say, I want to have your abortion. Because Fincher didn't have final cut privilege, Fox insisted that he change the line to something else. Yet Fincher somehow convinced the executives to agree to a deal that he changed the line once and only once. But Fincher never specified the change would actually have to be for the better, and so replaced the original line with an even more horrifying quip, I haven't been like that since grade school. Man, you gotta admire the balls on that man. Number 7. Miramax challenged Peter Jackson to find another willing studio, and he did. The Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson knew full well that he'd have a hard time convincing any studio to make his desired Lord of the Rings trilogy, and so pitched to Miramax a two-film series instead. But Miramax's then-parent company Disney ultimately presented a counter-offer, feeling that a duology was too financially risky. They instead suggested adapting the three books into a single abridged film, ditching Saruman completely, combining numerous characters and locations, cutting two of the Hobbits, and even using exposition dumps rather than, you know, 
actually filming crucial scenes from the book. Jackson naturally wasn't too keen on these compromises, so Miramax responded by giving him a month to find another studio who would get on board with his ambitious vision, or they'd just replace him with another director. So Miramax was clearly and understandably confident that Jackson, who had no experience in blockbuster fare and whose last film was a major box office bomb, wouldn't find a studio willing to give him hundreds of millions of dollars. But Jackson stuck to his guns and completely lucked out, as New Line Cinema ended up giving him a $281 million budget to make his entire Envision trilogy. It goes without saying that the Lord of the Rings trilogy was a phenomenal success for all involved, while Miramax was left kicking rocks. Number 6. Orson Welles told the studio that he was rehearsing while shooting the movie, Citizen Kane. Orson Welles was a trailblazer and a maverick like no other, a prodigy of a talented filmmaker whose perfectionism and ego ensured that he clashed constantly with studios. Welles was just 25 years old when he co-wrote, directed, and starred in both his directorial debut and magnum opus, Citizen Kane. And though Hollywood is littered with stories of studios bending young filmmakers to their will, Wells was evidently savvy beyond his years. Beyond having an unprecedented level of creative control in his contract, namely final cut privilege and the right to withhold dailies from the studio, Wells also schemed to keep executives in the dark as much as possible. During the first few days of the shoot, Wells told the studio RKO, who was in charge of it, that he and the rest of his crew were rehearsing when in fact the film was actually already in full production. This allowed Wells to get started free of any unwanted set visits or executive micromanagement, and the studio studio didn't catch on for a fair few days. And presumably by this point, Wells had some impressive dailies in the can in case he needed to keep the executives further at bay. Number 5. George Lucas took a low directing fee to keep merchandising and sequel rights. Star Wars A New Hope as much as Star Wars fans may have a love-hate relationship with George Lucas, there's no denying that the man made one of the shrewdest decisions in Hollywood history when assembling the original Star Wars. After numerous studios passed on Lucas's pitch, he finally struck gold with Fox, who agreed to finance Star Wars for $8 million in order to foster a working relationship with Lucas, whose previous film, American Graffiti, was nominated for five Oscars, including Best Director and Best Original Screenplay. Considering the phenomenal box office success of American Graffiti, Lucas was advised to renegotiate his Star Wars directing fee from $150,000 to $500,000, but he instead suggested a deal to Fox. He said that he would stick with $150,000 if he retained the full merchandising and sequel rights. Fox agreed and was soon enough left kicking themselves when Star Wars became a box office and merchandising goliath. Lucas bet on himself and it paid off dividends, enough that practices with regard to merchandising and sequel Equal negotiations changed drastically in the years that followed. Lucas ended up selling the entirety of the Star Wars IP, merch and all, to Disney for $4 billion in 2012, confirming just how thoroughly he outsmarted the studio who assumed that his film only had a limited commercial appeal. Number 4. Michael Patrick Jan refused to recut the film, Drop Dead Gorgeous Cult classic mockumentary Drop Dead Gorgeous didn't move the needle critically or commercially upon its initial 1909 release, but its subversive, darkly comic riff on teen movies of the era proved rather ahead of its time, and New Line Cinema was seemingly equally puzzled by the movie, as while the studio had largely left director Michael Patrick Jan alone during principal photography, they began to panic in post-production when the film's box office tracking turned out troublingly low. Executives asked him to create a new, softer cut which was closer in tone to the teen sensation Clueless in the hopes of elevating the film's box office prospects, but the director, frustrated at the studio's 180-degree turn in attitude to the project, ultimately elected not to compromise his vision. In his own words, it's too late, it's not like that, this is for the girls who went to Clueless and were like, them. Because there wasn't enough time to fix the film and New Line had already pre-sold international rights, they decided to simply release as is, having mostly mitigated their financial exposure before it hit cinemas thanks to its low $15 million budget. But the director got the last laugh by standing his ground and refusing to contrive a sanitized Frankenstein re-edit of the movie, because it found a second life on streaming in recent years, resulting in the critical re-evaluation of its entertaining deconstruction of the teen comedy genre. Number 3. The iconic propeller gag was created due to studio interference. 
Airplane. Iconic parody film Airplane probably isn't a movie that most people associate with executive meddling and galaxy brain filmmaking scheming, but a frustrating stipulation from Paramount inadvertently led to one of the film's best gags. Originally, directors David and Jerry Zucker and Jim Abrams wanted to heighten the absurdity of the comedy by having the titular vehicle be an old-fashioned propeller plane. However, Paramount insisted that it be switched out for a commercial jet airliner as to better connect with contemporary audiences. The film Makers agreed and in turn were allowed to cast a slew of serious actors in deadpan roles rather than recognizable comedians. But the Zuckers and Abrams didn't simply let the propeller fight go. They decided to have some fun with it by dubbing propeller sound effects all over the exterior shots of the plane throughout the movie. Better still, the sound effect is taken from the 1957 drama Zero Hour, which Airplane itself is a parody of. Talk about a brilliantly petty way to get back at the studio. Number 2. Zack Snyder Harnessed Social Media to Get His Cut Released Zack Snyder's Justice League Let's face it, we're all fed up talking about Zack Snyder's Justice League at this point in time, but the film's mere existence is nevertheless an extremely fascinating sign of the times. Justice League was of course originally released in 2017, with Joss Whedon reshooting a large percentage of the film after Snyder stepped away to deal with a family tragedy, in turn transforming his ambitious vision into a more, well let's face it, bland and commercial Avengers-esque tentpole. The so-called Whedon cut was a critical and commercial disappointment, and in the years that followed, Snyder continually talked up the existence of his own Snyder cut, which had already been cut together but still required extensive post-production work. For years, the Snyder cut seemed like nothing more than a pipe dream, an intriguing what-if, but not something that Warner Brothers would ever entertain bankrolling. But the power of the hashtag release the Snyder Cut was undeniable, fans passionately campaigning for the film in ways both creative and troublingly obsessive. Last year, Warner Brothers finally made their dreams come true by confirming that the Snyder Cut would indeed be completed, with Snyder being given $70 million to complete visual effects work and even shoot a small additional sequence. To the surprise of just about everyone, the end result was surprisingly solid. But more than the movie itself, it crowbarred open a discussion about not only the future of both film and streaming, but also the ability for online movements to actually get what they want. And number one, Alfred Hitchcock shot the film on a rival studio lot with his own money. Psycho Alfred Hitchcock is one of the shrewdest filmmakers the industry has ever seen, but his most brilliantly Machiavellian achievement might well be how he ingeniously schemed Psycho into existence. It's no secret that Paramount didn't want Hitchcock to make this film in the first place, feeling that the source novel was a bit too repulsive. Hitchcock bought the rights to the book anyway, but Paramount held firm, refusing to stump up the usual $3 to $4 million budget that his films commanded. Never one to be deterred though, Hitch fought back, making a series of concessions which ultimately ended up elevating the film. He agreed to shoot in black and white and self-finance the project on a budget of just over $800,000. Even then, Paramount still tried to talk the director out of it, insisting that they didn't have any spare sound stages where Psycho could be filmed. And at this point, Hitch pulled out his masterstroke. He agreed to shoot the film on a lot owned by rival studio Universal International, in turn only requiring Paramount to distribute the film. Hitch also waived his $250,000 director's fee, instead agreeing to receive 60% of the stake in the film's negative, which naturally proved to be far more lucrative soon enough. Hitch just kept trivializing Paramount's risk and exposure until they really just couldn't say no, and it sure as hell paid off.